Chapter 6 The Story of Astro Creator Azarin. Eno spent the night in her quarters on Deck 3, but she did not sleep easily. Axiom had spoken to her via intercom, asking Eno why she was not in the captain's quarters. You mean Captain Klein's quarters? Eno had replied. I understand, Axiom said. I will make arrangements for Klein's personal effects to be removed from the captain's quarters. Eno then fell asleep in her bunk without bothering to remove so much as her boots. About six hours later, Eno was roused by Axiom. Acting Captain Esperanta, we encountered a civilian while clearing the captain's quarters. Your input is required. Eno groggily flopped out of bed, landing on the floor. Face down in the folds of a discarded pressure suit, Eno grumbled, Civilian? I thought we put all civvies off the ship before we liberated Savassia. A programmable companion unit was found in Captain Klein's quarters. Eno was suddenly wide awake. There's an android in the captain's quarters? Thirty minutes later, Eno, Sota, and Elodie were standing in the captain's quarters, two decks below where the bridge used to be. The trio were staring slack-jawed at the sight before them. Prisbin, Eno's friend from before the war, was sitting on a couch in the living space, fiddling with a remote control. He clicked the buttons and pointed the device at the unfamiliar woman seated in the armchair next to him. She was unconscious, her head lolling to one side. Eno could tell she was dealing with a synthetic life form right away. The sleeping woman had glossy white skin, most likely made from a silicone substance. Her hair, falling down over her face in luxurious black waves, had an unnatural metallic sheen to it. She wore a simple black dress that showed a layer of dust. The android had been like this for a day. Sota reached into his pocket and produced a PADCOM, a multi-use tablet computer that was frequently used in the Coalition. He activated the PADCOM's built-in scanning unit and held it over the unconscious woman. I've seen these before, Sota said. She's a PCU, a programmable companion unit. They're personal use androids, really popular where I come from. It looks like this one's been configured to work as... Ah. Sota held the scanner over the android's head. She's been set up for multiple uses, Sota reported. I see a secretary program, so she was taking the captain's calls. There's also a mental health subroutine. Klein was using her as a private therapist. And... Oh, come on. I know it's there. Got it! Ha! I knew it was there. <laughs> She's got an overriding line of code that forces her to treat Captain Klein as a close friend. Sota laughed. Elodie giggled. Eno looked scandalized. <laughs> yeah, this girl was the captain's special best friend, Elodie said, raising her hands to make air quotes and speaking in a sarcastic tone. So, what are we going to do with her? That's why you're here, Eno said, pointing at Elodie. The ship's security chief is dead. I need a new one. What are you doing? The marine detachment has no more officers, Elodie replied, looking over at the android out of the corner of her eye. I had to take over the team, so I'm like their unofficial leader now. Eno tapped Elodie's shoulder. Add ship security to your duties. I'm giving you a field promotion to gunnery sergeant. Then Eno pointed at the android. This android is to be treated as a civilian. As soon as she wakes up, take her out of here and get her away from the command deck. Confine her to a low security area. At that moment, Prisbin let out a cry of triumph. I got it! The android woke up. She had bright red eyes that stood out sharply against her black and white features. Why are you all here? What's going on? Where is Captain Klein? You've been offline for about a day, Eno said. What's your name? Nilla, the android replied. It's short for vanilla. My security chief will help you and tell you about... Uh, well... Everything that's happened. Gunny Sergeant Lichtenstein, please take her off the command deck. 
Eno said, trying to stop her voice from cracking. Elodie took Nilla by the shoulder and led her out of the captain's quarters. Sota let out a low whistle. You're really getting into the captain's role, Esperanta, he said. Was that the first time you promoted someone? Second, Eno replied. I knew the repair crews needed time to work on Adimash before the storm hits, so I'm using the downtime to build my command crew. I promoted Prisbin and made him the new chief tactical officer this morning. Prisbin passed the remote control to Eno. This belongs to the android. If you don't need anything else, I'll head back to the CIC. It's the bridge now, Eno called after him. The new CIC is on deck five. Then Eno turned to Sota. By the way, Benny Nato, can I ask your help for something? Uh, sure, Sota said. Something happened this morning that's been bugging me, Eno said. When I walked from my quarters to the new bridge, there was a junior lieutenant from engineering who didn't make way for me in the hall. Sota's face hardened. He was the chief engineer, and whoever disrespected Eno was one of his own subordinates. Was he American? Wavy brown hair? Chubby face? Yeah, Eno said. How did you know? That's Junior Lieutenant Perry. He's got a problem with authority. Hates taking orders from anyone younger than himself. I'll deal with him. You deal with him? Then meet me in Hangar Bay 2 at 1400 hours, Eno said. I still need to ask you for a favor. Eno spent most of the day in the ready room a small office meant for use by the ship's commanding officer. The space was hers now. It would take some getting used to. Later in the day, Eno made her way down to the hangar. She had called for a meeting with the surviving Marathon officers. Eno, Rylan, Sota, Elodie, Prisbin, and eleven other officers gathered underneath the wing of an SU-77 Electronic Warfare Starfighter. Eno stood on an empty crate, and spoke up to the group. Under Coalition Continuity of Command protocols, and with the consent of Admiral Garnett before his death, I am now the acting captain of the Marathon. I want to announce that I've selected my command team, and then talk about our new mission. Eno produced a padcom and started to read names off the screen. She read the names of every officer attending the meeting, matching each person to a new duty and promoting those who needed it. Petty Officer Raha, Navigator. Petty Officer Tai, Air Boss. This is your hangar now. Zapata, you already know you're the Chief Medic, but I'm going to make you a full lieutenant. Take off the junior stripe. Petty Officer Minje, you're the new armorer. Talk to Lichtenstein about what the Marines need. Hamilton, you wanted to be Boatswain? You got it. Indungane, Communications Officer. Mancini, you're the new EW Officer. I'm promoting you to Petty Officer 1. Zhao Hui, you're Chief of the Watch, and I'm promoting you. Take the Junior Lieutenant Stripes from Zapata. Oliver, you're the new Chaplain. Eno finished, then looked around. Lichtenstein, I need you to pick a second-in-command for the Marine Detachment. Novikova, Elodie replied. She's a Lance Corporal, but she's good. Well, now she's a Sergeant, Eno replied, then addressed her new command team. Here's the situation, everyone. The ship is crippled, and we've lost contact with Strategic Command. Our escort fleet is destroyed, and our allies need help. We are going to turn the ship around and go back to Earth at best possible speed. We'll do this as soon as our Savanti allies are out of danger. Are we still in danger now, Captain? said Mancini. Yes, Eno replied. There's a space storm coming our way. It contains life-threatening radiation. We must complete repairs to the Adimash before that happens. Then we'll set a course for the Hodranus wormhole. It'll take us directly back to Coalition space. Does everyone understand? Good, let's get to work. As the command team broke up and moved to start their tasks, Eno grabbed Sota and pulled him aside. You said you wanted to ask a favor? Sota asked. Axiom let me look in your background files, Eno said. I... I want you as my XO. Sota took a deep breath. I'm... I'm honored to be asked, he said. But I developed a commanding style that might clash with yours. 
So far, you seem to be a respectful woman who leads collaboratively, building teams and fostering allies. I am... You have an authoritarian side, I know, Eno said. I need a hard ass for my number two, to get my orders through to people like that Perry guy. I know there's more of them on the ship. Good point, Sota said. I'll pick an engineer to replace me as chief by the end of the day, or do you need to take the con sooner than that? Sooner, Eno said. I, uh, I need to go over to the Adimash. Eno and a small escort crossed through the airlock to the Adimash. Captain Quinn met her on the other side. Eno felt her heart flutter at the sight of the towering cyborg and struggled to keep her eyes on him. That space storm is intensifying, Ryland told Eno. Our sensors report that ionizing radiation is already increasing to dangerous levels. I was worrying about that, Eno said. We're not dealing with a normal storm, Captain. It's part of that supernova that wrecked our ships. For the safety of everyone involved, I want you to bring all of your people over to my ship now. Like I said, our shields are fully online. We'll just have to complete repairs when the storm passes. After that, Eno and some marathon engineers made their way to the hydroponics lab. Astro creator Azarin seemed to know that she would not be able to stay and was already packing her things. Your men fret over nothing, Azarin told Eno, shooing the engineers away with a leafy hand. I can move this lab to your ship without help. But there's so much equipment to move, Eno said. It'll take dozens of shuttle flights. Azarin regarded Eno with a wide smile. Follow me into the vivarium. I will show you. Perplexed, Eno complied, following Azarin through a corridor that led out of the hydroponics bay. The team of marathon engineers followed cautiously. Uh, wait a minute. Is this an airlock? Eno asked as the door closed behind her. Azarin nodded and opened the far door. Eno's jaw fell open at the sight before her. She was in a very large open space, stretching hundreds of feet in any direction. The walls rose up to form a dome-shaped ceiling. A complex metal apparatus hung from the ceiling, where water gently sprayed from an irrigation system, and lights shone down on the whole place. Looking down, Ina realized exactly what the irrigation system was for. As soon as Eno and Azarin had stepped out of the airlock, they had found themselves in a lush, tropical rainforest. The group of engineers gasped, all saying, Oh, and ah. This is the biosphere, Azarin said. The control system is at the center of the arboretum. Eno was still slack-jawed as Azarin led her through a dense patch of trees their leaves dripping with simulated rainwater. Some of the tree trunks were so massive that Eno wondered if they were over a hundred years old. When they reached the center of the arboretum, Azarin guided Eno into a metallic structure that looked like a bunker. The bunker itself was hard to see, shrouded by leaves the size of elephants. An ancient alien tree grew so high it shrouded the apparatus above, throwing the bunker into shadow. Stepping through the door, Eno found herself back in a familiar spaceship environment. While Azarin manipulated the controls, she said, The Vivarium is more than a starship. It is my home. Eno looked around, admiring the control center. There were wide windows all around, allowing Eno to look at the biosphere from most angles. I've never heard of a science vessel so completely given over to hydroponics like this, Eno said. This is incredible. How many of these did your people build? Are the research facilities on your homeworld like this too? The question was barely out of Eno's mouth when she realized something. She did not know Azarin's species. Eno had met plantoids before, but Azarin did not resemble the shrub-like Lozavatan people, nor did she look like the Yastun, tree-like people who were frequently compared with the mythical dryads of human mythology. Azarin was 
something wholly different. Speaking nonchalantly, not looking up from the starship controls, Azarin said, The Vivarium is my own creation. It is one of a kind. And the Desticans looted our research facilities after the Plexus fell. Eno's heart skipped a beat. She knew that before the current war, the Destican Astral Fellowship had invaded and conquered several other spacefaring civilizations. Azarin must belong to one of the alien races that were enslaved, Eno told herself. Oh, I'm so sorry, Eno said, adopting a gentler tone. But the war is going well. Maybe we'll liberate your world, too. Azarin, still speaking in an unconcerned tone, simply replied, My people are not enslaved by the Desticans, though I am touched by your concern. There was a powerful lurch. Eno looked over Azarin's shoulder and spotted a sensor readout. The Vivarium really was a starship, and it had just undocked from the Adimash. Azarin asked Eno's team to help her dock with the Marathon. One of the engineers started guiding her toward Runway 1 Alpha. As the approach went on, Eno's curiosity got the best of her. Where is your homeworld? I've never heard about your people before. You have not heard about my people, because we are functionally extinct, Azarin replied in a casual tone. Eno stammered. Wait, functionally extinct? What does that mean? There are very few of my people left, scattered throughout the galaxy, Azarin said. But there are not enough left to repopulate our species, let alone rebuild the Astrophyton Plexus. Thus, even if the last of my kind has not died yet, we are extinct by all scientific terminologies. There's no need to look so sorrowful. Azarin had noticed the expression of dismay on Eno's face. Did you say Astrophyton Plexus? Eno said. I've heard that name. An empire that existed about two, three hundred years ago, or something like that. Azarin nodded. My life began during the final days of our civilization, Azarin said. Our world was called Asathea and it was one of the most beautiful Gaia worlds in the galaxy. Our empire was home to many different species. Sadly, they are all lost now. Azarin allowed her gaze to drift. Then she continued, as though grateful to share her story with someone. At its pinnacle, Azathea was a wonder to behold, teeming with life and natural beauty. I imagine such biological diversity was found nowhere else, but I never saw it myself. Azathea, our interstellar empire, our civilization, it all fell apart. The decline was already irreversible in my youth. Azarin sighed. The Desticans colonized my homeworld just before I reached maturity. And by then, well, they should be forgiven for thinking us primitives. We were expelled, sent to the Outer Rim. I settled at the Curator Enclave, studied biology, became an Astro Creator, built the Vivarium, took my research to the stars. The Vivarium sublight engines rumbled. One of the Marathon's engineers punched the comms button. Marathon Air Boss, this is... Uh... The Flying Biosphere? We're lined up on Runway 1 Alpha, requesting permission to land. The Vivarium rumbled as it made contact with the Marathon. Azarin turned to face Eno. Before you go back to your duties, I have another question for you, Esperanta, Azarin said. Tell me, to escape death, would you take the life of another?
creeping in my soul, it's getting out of control. I gotta find my escape, get out of this black hole. Cause justice in the world is hard to find. Time has come, gotta make up my mind. No matter how deep or remote I hide, all my thoughts seem caught up inside. Creeps from the deep, gonna be freaking up your mind. Creeps from the 